Good evening, and welcome to the Pepperdine University School of Law. Please rise and join the School of Law in welcoming the Honorable Carolyn Deneen King, the Honorable Dorothy W. Nelson, the Honorable Rosemary Barquette, and the Honorable Dean Danelle Reese Taha, the Dwayne and Kelly Roberts Dean of the School of Law. name be seated please my name is Daryl Tippins and I'm the provost at Pepperdine University it's my distinct pleasure to welcome each and every one of you one of the pleasures of working at a great university like Pepperdine University is that you're able to participate in so many special events solemn some of them celebratory others whether it was our 9-11 commemoration just a few days ago or our institution's annual birthday party we call it Founders Day, just two days ago, we Pepperdiners really enjoy gathering and remembering and celebrating. And today is one of those happy occasions when we formally recognize and welcome the Duane and Kelly Roberts Dean and Professor of Law, Danelle Reese Taha. Here, here. Uh, Dean, by my calculation, today's welcome is only 115 days late since you started <laughs> on June the 1st. <laughs> but such minor legal details never stop us from having a party. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this celebration to recognize and greet and salute our wonderful new Dean. And I want to take a moment now in particular to recognize family members, uh, husband John and mother Mary Nell, daughter Sarah, friend Megan, and other friends of the family here with us today. Would you honor them, please? <laughs> To our platform party, especially our distinguished judges, our excellent faculty and students and faithful alumni, and our many other loyal friends, we say welcome and thank you. Thank you for helping us honor our Dean. Thank you, Daryl, and thanks to all of you for being here. When they approached me and asked me how I wanted to be greeted at Pepperdine, <laughs> I said, no big lectures. Um, <laughs> And then I began to think about what was really important to me. And as you know, I spent 25 years on the United States Court of Appeals. And in the process, I met some women whose journey had, journeys had been very similar to my own. And they're journeys and stories that have very little been told. We were soldiering through all those years. And uh, unlike some other groups, our story is sort of haven't hit the light of day. So I decided that what, would, what I would treasure was gathering three of my closest friends in the judiciary whose lives have paralleled in some ways my own uh, so that students, primarily students, would know that, you know, societal change often happens very slowly. But to us, a great societal change happened with rapid speed. Uh, and so what happened to us in the early days of our career and then now where we are in our careers uh, is the story I've asked my dear friends to tell. I want to add my thanks to my family and to the Van Wildens who are here with me. Uh, I so greatly appreciate that. And the faculty and students, thank you. You have made me feel very welcome, welcome enough that it's time to hear these stories. So Judge King, I'd like to start with you. Your career, I think it's fair to say, and you have said, has spanned the time of the Civil Rights Movement. Right. Would you just talk about what it was like when you came in and what your experiences were then? I began practicing law in Houston in 1962. Uh, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. So we have sort of grown up together. Uh, I 
when I moved to Houston, I, I had just graduated from the Yale Law School, and my husband had graduated from the Yale Law School, and we moved to Houston on the theory that we didn't know anyone in the city of Houston except the two partners at Baker Botts who had interviewed my husband. So we came there on August the 1st, 1962, with $80 to our name and a six-year-old Chevrolet station wagon and knew no one. I went for an interview with the United States Attorney because I did have a letter of reference from the Department of Justice that I had worked for the preceding summer. And it was a nice glowing letter, so I was very hopeful. The United States Attorney took me to a stand-up coffee place for my interview. I never made it into his office. And when we got back to his office, he put his Stetson on the hat tree in the corner and he said, don't get me wrong, ma'am. I've hired me a black and I've hired me a Mexican, but I ain't up to hiring me a woman yet. <laughs> That's exactly what he said, except you may be wondering whether he used racial epithets, and the answer is he did, okay? Now, the other thing you need to know about him is that he was a bleeding heart liberal, and he had hired the first black assistant United States attorney in the United States, and he had hired the first Mexican assistant United States attorney. But such was the prospect of hiring a woman that it was unthinkable. My next interview was with Leon Jaworski at Fulbright and Jaworski. He made it plain that he didn't have a place for me, and then called me back and asked me to come see him. And when I got back there, he said, well, we've decided to make you an offer. We want you to do collection work, and we'll pay you $250 a month, which was half of what the men were making. So Sandra O'Connor, was her first offer was to be a secretary. I at least moved up to collection work. <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. I know that you are trying to make a place for me when you have none, and I appreciate that but I've worked too hard at Yale to start off doing, being paid half of what the men are paid, and I don't want to do collection work. So he said, okay, we'll give you a job, and you can do whatever you want to do, and we'll pay you what we're paying the men. <laughs> so there, just say no is sometimes the answer. <laughs> uh, but you see, you remember, this was all before the Civil Rights Act was passed. Uh, ten years later, I spent at Fulbright, and I worked, I did wonderful work as far as I was concerned. I did transactions work, big transactions. I was paid, I worked 2,500 to 3,000 hours a year, according to what the firm tells me, and I uh, was paid enormous amounts of money because I was generating a lot of money. When I came up for partner, Leon Jaworski said, no. Uh, and I said, you don't like my work? Oh, no, your work is fine. I haven't put in enough time? No, no, you put in more time than anyone else. My client relations? Excellent. Well, then what is the problem? Why am I not going to make partner? And he said, well, your husband's a partner at Baker Botts. I said, well, he, has that ever been a problem? No, no, it's never been a problem. Well, I was... He was there when I was hired here. Oh, yes, but we thought you'd just get pregnant and quit. <laughs> and so I realized that I had spent 10 very hard years, happy years for me, but very hard years, working for a law firm that was operating on, under the premise that I would soon get pregnant and quit. And I got pregnant and had two baby boys all in the midst of this, and I'm sure they thought, aha, deliverance. Uh, <laughs> in more ways than one, but I came back to work in a month, and, that, and so it wasn't deliverance. And so I was passed over for partner in a major law firm, and this was in 1972. In 1979, the chair of the merit screening panel came to see me, President Carter's merit screening panel, and said, we would like, we're looking for a woman to be a judge on the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Do you have any interest in that? And I said, no, why would I do that? I mean, I was a transactions lawyer.
the last thing in the world we ever wanted to do was get near a courtroom. You know, that was, <laughs> that was a sign of adversity, to put it mildly. So my answer to that question was no. He said, well, no, no, no. I said, and furthermore, I'm a Republican. Wrong party. And he said, oh, well, that doesn't matter. I might say that that's the last president about whom we could say that, <laughs> of either party. And so uh, he pursued me and uh, finally uh, persuaded me that I, had, I was at that point the chief financial officer of the United Way in addition to being a partner in a small firm. And he persuaded me that I needed to do this job for public service. And so I took the job for basically for public service reasons and here I am today. Um, and, and Judge King, I might add, ended up being Chief Judge of the Fifth Circuit. She was on the Judicial Conference of the United States, and then she was Chair of the Executive Committee. And Judge King and I can tell you that when we were involved on the Executive Committee in the conference, there were several women of our vintage who were chairing committees and in the most responsible positions right. in the Judicial That's Conference. That's exactly right. So in the course of my lifespan, my professional lifespan, we've gone from uh, not being able to get a job because you were a woman to being chosen because you were a woman to now being at the point where the fact that you are a woman is neither an asset nor a liability, it's simply a fact. And it's been, you realize that I am the beneficiary of government. My parents, who grew up in upstate New York and thought that President Roosevelt was a socialist <laughs> uh, and, and lectured me that one never, one should always have small government, small government, close to base, was the theory, um, I would not be where I am today if it were not for government, what government did for me. And for all of us here on this podium, and for many of you in this audience, we are the beneficiaries of government. Now, and I think it would be fair to say, we are also the beneficiaries of the highest aspirations of the American people, because those laws wouldn't have been passed had it not been for the fact that Americans were willing to do right by other Americans. That's why we're here. Thank you. <laughs> Judge Nelson, I chose in part because these are my very best friends, but also in part because all four of us came from very different backgrounds and different experiences. Judge Nelson, uh, predates us, if you can believe it. Uh, <laughs> she looks younger than any of us. Uh, but uh, Judge Nelson went to law school before both of us and came from academia. So do you have some stories that you'd like to tell? Well, I do, but I first have to say, I congratulate Pepperdine for enticing Dean Taha to become a dean. She is the most, was one of the most beloved, respected judges of the entire Judicial Conference of the United States, the United States Court of Appeals. And I got to see her at our Ninth Circuit Conference each year to present awards from the American Inns of Court, which she was president of and promoted to promote civility and professionalism in the profession. I, I have great ties with Pepperdine on the advisory committee of the Strauss Institute. When, Ron, when I was dean at USC, Ron Phillips was dean here. We had both interested in dispute resolution and mediation. So I think Pepperdine, I'm just thrilled to have Dean Taha right across the way. Well, I started out in law school. There were only two women in my law school class. And we had, <laughs> we were very well received. It's that one professor, and we loved it. My colleague and I, he would only call on the women when it was Ladies' Day. So we could sit in class and be very relaxed, and then he announced it was Ladies' Day, and we'd stay up all night. We were so well prepared, and, and we loved him for it. But uh, that no longer exists. When I graduated, the two of us, I was offered a job at O'Melveny and Myers. This is in 1953. Uh, because I had done work in the community, I knew the senior partner 
Paul Fussell of a Melvin and Mars. And then I was offered uh, a research job at USC to complete a book on improving the court system in Los Angeles County. My husband said, you've been <laughs> criticizing the system all through law school. Why don't you take the job you want? One was for $250 a month. Uh, Melvany offered $350 a month. So I went to USC and I got my master's as a result of working on this book. We got 33 bills through the legislature. We proposed court administrative officers. We had the first in LA County and the like. But I had to take 20 units to get my master's and one was a course in judicial administration, which was a perfectly awful course. He was taught by a vice president university, now deceased, won't be mentioned, and he would come in with anecdotes unprepared. He was called to Europe, and the dean called me in and said, would you like to take over this course? And I said, would I? <laughs> I had interviewed every judge in the county. I had interviewed 2,000 jurors, sat in all of the departments of the court, both municipal and superior, and I assigned each student to a judge. We would have class two hours a day, we go on field trips on Wednesday mornings. I started in the drunk tank, took them all the way up to the Supreme Court of California. Then we went over to the federal side. And during the time that I was teaching, Justice Tom Clark came to town. He had a committee on promoting the effective administration of justice. And the dean called me and said, would you like to be his reporter? And I said, sure. So I was, and at the end of the course, I called up Mr. Justice Clark and said, would you consider meeting with my class at the end of the year? As only he could say, well, honey, anything you want. So I came down and said to the dean, Justice Clark is gonna meet with my seminar, we had 20 of us at the end of the semester. He is, well, no, he's gonna meet with a whole student body. Well, at any rate, at the end of the year, the students marched in and said, hire her, and she said, but she's a woman, and we don't have any women faculty. But he had a good heart, and I started as the low person on the totem pole, an assistant professor. Well, I moved through the ranks. I was accepted by the faculty. At that time, we had only 15 faculty. When I left as dean, we had 33. But it was their wives that had a problem with, why am I here? Why am I the only woman on the faculty? Now, some of the women wouldn't approve, but I took great pains to have each member of the faculty to my home to dinner, to see my husband, to see my children. I'm a happily married woman. And speaking about husbands, I have to tell you that I could not have been a law professor, a dean, a member of this court, without my husband and my favorite story about Jim, who died in February after 60 years of happy marriage. We were in China. I've been to China many times, working on, with their legal system and with their law schools. Our first visit, we were guests at the Supreme People's Court and I said to our translator, Mr. Sun, I want to meet some Chinese women. He said, why do you want to meet women? <laughs> He said, their number three visit, your number one visit. I said, Mr. Sun, I am a woman and I would like to meet them. And he said, is the judge coming? Well, my husband was a judge of the Superior Court. He was the judge. <laughs> and my husband said, of course I'm coming. So we went and I gave my usual talk about equality of women and men, like the two wings of a bird. The one is male, the other is female, unless both wings are strong. The bird not come, cannot fly upwards. The Chinese love these sort of stories. But you can't take the right wing of a bird and put it in the left socket. It doesn't fit. Men and women need full equality, uh, equal pay, equal education, but they have different and distinct qualities. And we need all of those qualities if we're ultimately going to have the peace of the world. Well, Mr. Sun translated very slowly, but my husband raised his hand and said, I'd like to say something. And he said, until women achieve full equality, men cannot be the best they can be. 
Oh boy, did he translate that solely. But then there was <laughs> grand applause. They ran down the hall, brought him back, a beautiful present of Corcade boxes. And as we left, they patted my husband on the shoulder, saying something like, and I always get it wrong, Mo Fang Zhang Fu. I said, Mr. Sun, what are they saying? Model husband, model <laughs> husband. <laughs> so, my model husband and I uh, survived through law school, and I had some, uh, some touchy times in law school. My students and the students of architecture and dentistry marched to downtown to the mayor's office and posted letters of protest after the Kent State Cambodia incident. The chairman of the board of trustees, who later was replaced, thank heavens, said the deans of law, architecture, and dentistry are to be fired. So my thought as a law dean was to have a law center. We started the Western Center on Law and Poverty, the Gerontology Center. We had joint degrees with public administration, business, and so forth. And I had a lot of friends on campus, and I was then chairman of the Council of Deans. And I wrote, the dean of dentistry was fired. The dean of, of architecture was fired. When I went in to see the president, I said, you want to make a case against me? Do it. If I'm not doing my job, I'll leave gladly, knowing full well I had the support of my faculty. But finally, we got a new chairman of the Board of Trustees who happened to be head of Southern California Edison and called me up and said, Dean, I want to be in your law school for two weeks. See what you're doing. Beware. Anyway. <laughs> He was there two weeks, and the Monday after, he put me on the board of directors of Southern California Edison, <laughs> <laughs> where, where I stayed until I became a judge. Well, I, have to, I cannot speak too much, but my real interest was in alternative dispute resolution or appropriate dispute resolution, mediation. I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith. We mediate everything in 182 countries. Then, when Pepperdine had its dispute resolution center, I had one at USC, and we became great friends. Peter Robinson and Ron Phillips, the dean. Uh, Pepperdine was like a second home to me. Well, uh, we started this dispute resolution center, and when I, when you talked about merit selection, because I was the only woman dean of an ABA accredited school, every president put me on a commission. President Nixon put me on the White House Commission on Children, and President Reagan put me on the Madison Trust. President Ford put me on the <laughs> Advisory Committee for the Air Force Academy. I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm an independent. But Roscoe Pound, who had taught me seven courses at UCLA, recommended me and gave me a membership in the American Judicature Society. So when I was chairman of that society, I wrote when Ford was running against Carter. He said, if elected, will you adopt merit selection to include women and minorities? If elected, of course, their staff wrote back, of course we will. I was astounded after Carter was elected. I got a call from the Attorney General, Griffin Bell, Dorothy, come back and set up merit selection for Court of Appeals judges. I said, I can't believe you're asking me. Well, we did. We set up 12 commissions around the country. President Carter came in and said, I want them to seek out women and minorities. They sought out Carolyn King, yes, and because of that commission, we were lucky enough to have her come on the court. But the interesting thing about dispute resolution, when I came on the Ninth Circuit, I'd always wanted a research and development center for dispute resolution in the West. They're all in the East. So we set up the Western Justice Center next to our beautiful courthouse in Pasadena, to which you're all invited, especially students. Um, we have a center to promote peaceful resolution of conflict among children in the courts and in the community. And what I found out that when I became a federal judge, I had more power and more clout. I would go to India, I'd go to Germany or China, 
as a professor, and they clap nicely and say, how nice of you to come. When I went as a federal judge, it was, how do we do it? Uh, when shall we do it? Well, I've overstepped my time, but I once again <laughs> would like to congratulate yes. Pepperdine on having my dear friend, Dean Taha, as a Thank dean. Thank you, Dora. <laughs> I don't know why she's saying that. She's my model, and she's my mentor. She's the model of w not just women deans, good deans. Judge Barquette came a very different way to the bench, and in part uh, because of the faith commitment of this community, I thought it would be interesting for Judge Barquette to reflect on her choices that she made and Judge Barquette and I went to law school exactly the same year, which was, I, I will, I'm, this is not about me, but I will say that we all understand that one very terrible war was the reason we got into law school. Uh, the Vietnam conflict took so many men, the law schools had to fill their, their classes. And so in our class, I, you'll tell what it was like for you, in my class at Michigan, there were precious few women in my class, but by the time I had graduated, so 68 to 71, uh, they needed the women and they admitted almost a quarter of the class by 1971. So those were watershed years. Uh, it's sad that so many people lost their lives and, and uh, our nation was so embattled, but the other side of that coin is, just as you refer to the Civil Rights uh, Acts, for us, it was the Vietnam conflict that got us in. Rosemary. Thanks, Janelle. First of all, I, I, um, before I start talking about me, I have to say, uh, I, this is a sort of investiture, I know. And I have been to very many investitures, and I squirmed through many of them when speakers got up and ended up speaking more about themselves than the investee. <laughs> I have never, ever been to one where the investee demands that you speak about yourself. <laughs> and I have to say that to put together a unique investiture such as this one takes a great generosity of spirit, a great humility and self-assurance, and the soul of a great teacher. And so I am thrilled that she is here, and I think you're going to be very, very happy that she is as well. Um, I too benefited from the United States government and from the American people. I am an immigrant. I was born in Mexico. Uh, I came to this country, my parents were Arabic, they were Syrian, but they had spent 20 some years in Mexico where uh, my siblings and I were all born and pretty much raised. I'm down towards the bottom of a fairly large family and uh, when we came here, I was six years old, so I started school, and this was in 1946. So it was way before the Cuban influx, and nobody spoke Spanish in those days except my family. So I went to school uh, knowing no English, uh, but it didn't take very long to learn, as my colleagues on the court tell me. I learned it enough to keep talking a lot. <laughs> but. Uh, I, um, I, I grew up in Miami and uh, attended Jesu School, Notre Dame Academy, which were both um, religious uh, schools staffed by the Sisters of St. Joseph. And when I graduated from high school, I felt I had a vocation, so I became a member of the order and was there for approximately eight years. So when I left, um, I left in the 60s when the Vietnam War was ongoing, when the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil Rights Marches were occurring, and when I felt that there was perhaps a more direct way of making a contribution uh, than that of a, teaching, uh, of a teaching order, although I've stayed very close to my good friends uh, uh, in, in the... Uh, convent and the Sisters of St. Joseph. When I left, I taught for a year and then decided I wanted to go to law school. So I went to the University of Florida. It was a state school. And um, my experiences there, in terms of direct discrimination, 
you want to call it, discrimination, which I guess it was. We, I was only one of about four or five law students uh, at the time, and the boys were uh, very bent on, I, and I, I don't, I honestly don't think it was malicious, but it was, um, uh, it was, they were bent on embarrassing us. So every time a woman walked in the library, they would perform a shuffling, is what they called it, and they would shuffle their feet on the wooden floor, and so there would be this din that you would hear the minute that you walked into the, uh, I see some of you guys, older guys, smiling. <laughs> you think it's funny. <laughs> um, uh, and, and when you were called upon in class or you volunteered in class, the shuffling would begin if it was a woman that was answering. And the, basically, that was kind of the extent of the direct um, kind of discrimination that occurred. But there was, a, there was also a very indirect discrimination that occurred in that when I left law school, I, I didn't have a job. And it had never occurred to me, because no one had suggested to me that you go to the law firm interviews in the school. I didn't even know they existed. Um, and because the, the networking that occurred, occurred with the guys in the clubs and in the um, societies and, and so forth, so that you, you really weren't aware of the opportunities that existed. Um, I got a job shortly after I left law school because three of the men in my class that had been hired by a trial litigation, a trial firm, a litigation, a very small litigation firm, uh, started work and one of them after two days either quit or was fired. I never was clear, but they needed a body immediately. So one of my classmates called and said, do you want to come to work for a law firm uh, here in West Palm Beach? And uh, I said, sure, great. I interviewed, I got the job. Uh, plain, it was a plaintiff's law firm, and plaintiff's law firms, for those of you that know and the students that might not know, uh, they have one interest in mind. They want to hire somebody that is going to win cases, <laughs> and they really uh, have a tendency to care less than maybe some of the larger firms that feel like they have to present a certain um, a certain face, as it were, to the clients and to the world, at least in those, in those days. And so once you were able to get in and become successful, uh, they were very, very happy to have you. So I found trial work tremendously rewarding because to me it was very much like teaching. Uh, you walk into a courtroom and you explain to the jury what your case is all about, and then you are, uh, able, you believe, you hope, to persuade them that your version of whatever it is that occurred, uh, occurred. So I was, um, I enjoyed it very, very much. I love trial practice, but I have to tell you that then I had the opportunity to uh, apply for a state trial court uh, uh, trial uh, <coughs> position because the trial bar in the, um, in the Palm Beach area said, we want, the governor wants to appoint a woman, but we want a trial lawyer to be a trial judge because many times judges were coming from other fields, tax law or, <laughs> or collection security work never or before. security. Never <laughs> but uh, so I applied and was appointed and then appointed to the Intermediate Court of Appeals and then I was fortunate enough to be appointed to the Florida Supreme Court. Um, the, 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 the nuances of being treated differently is, are very different at that level. And it, it, um, it has to do a lot more, especially later, because by this time it was 1985. And we had gone through training and sensitivity and uh, discrimination training and so forth. And so you had, we had gotten past the point of overt uh, kind of behavior, or at least mostly. But, but there was also, there's always still the sort of very subtle um, attitude, the subtle exclusions that occur, and I think still occur 
in, uh, in our legal community. The, 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 the fact that we still have not accommodated to the different styles that women bring, especially to the courtroom, for example, or to oral argument, uh, or even to conferences, where if a woman is speaking in an emphatic tone of voice, less attention is perhaps accorded to the message that she is conveying. And I think we're getting to the point where there are enough, well, I mean, now there's, but Pepperdine must have half women just about in the student body. And the legal profession is, is slowly getting to that point where you can differentiate between styles and attitudes and uh, uh, aptitudes. Uh, but I, I've, been, uh, I've, I've been extremely fortunate to have come uh, to this country and to have experienced the welcome that the Statue of Liberty um, expresses and to have been given all of the tremendous opportunities that, that I have had. And I absolutely love the fact that I'm able to give back in the context of serving to the extent that, uh, that, that I can. You've referred to it, uh, Judge Barquet, but there is clearly a difference in style. Uh, between men and women. And I'm often asked, what is it about those different styles? Does that, that, that affect your work, or does anything ever affect your work? You've referred to style in the classroom, I mean in the courtroom, same thing goes with the classroom. Uh, I'd like you each briefly to say something about what you think your style is and if there's anything to be learned by students, both men and women, uh, and of all ethnicities, uh, about personal style. Judge King? Uh, you know, it's funny, I haven't thought about that. Um, I am very open. <laughs> I think that's the word. I don't have much, if any, pretense. Um, and I think that's sort of unnerving for people. <laughs> um, but what you see is what you get. And, and uh, I think that that's, I really haven't experienced uh, a problem because of, that I would attribute to my style. I'm very open. Does it affect your judging? Do you think there's any difference at all? In the way I judge? Well, I, I think I have, if you'll excuse me for saying this, I think I have less pretense than some of my colleagues. <laughs> I, um, there may be a little difference there. Um, but, but that's about it. I just, I refuse to see differences like that. I just sort of take the position they're not there. And, uh, and if you take that position, they're not. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Nelson, would you like to? Well, I, I must say, when I first came on the faculty and I was teaching a course in the administration of justice, I added mediation. This is 19, before anybody was born, 1957. I went to a faculty meeting and I heard someone say, what's Dorothy teaching? Mediation, that's not law. The answer was, oh, she's just trying to get everybody to love each other. <laughs> so it, it gives me a great deal of pleasure that it is one of the hottest topics in the justice system today. And when I came on the Court of Appeals, and I said to our chief judge, why don't we have a mediator? In the Court of Appeals, why would anybody mediate if they've won below? Well, they might lose with us, and maybe we can get a better solution. Well, when I became dean, a senior faculty member said, Dorothy, show them who's boss. Arrive at faculty meeting 15 minutes late. Keep them waiting. Instead, I went home and baked five dozen chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> announced there would be food at the faculty meeting, and I found this to be true with judges as well. If you have long meetings without food, People get snippy and nasty <laughs> and, you know, after about an hour. I guess so my feeling is be yourself. 
Don't try and copy what somebody else has done if it's not you. And if you have feelings about how to bring people together, well then give way to those feelings. Because I think, well, because of this, when I started serving food at judges meetings, I got assigned to talk at conferences about collegiality. <laughs> <laughs> Until Judge Reinhardt wrote, if Judge Nelson has to give one more lecture on collegiality, <laughs> I'm gonna walk out. Well, that was a sign of, they just didn't wanna talk about it. But I, I just think women do bring something and shouldn't be afraid to bring their own feelings and their own experiences. You know, as a mother, you are in charge of, I ended up with my own two children and then my sister died and I had four little girls and one boy and you have to be a mediator. And you, <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, I guess, I do think women do bring something different and they shouldn't be afraid to do it. Judge Barquette. You know, the, lots of times you see articles, uh, law review articles or whatever articles that talk about women as judges and w what effect being a woman has on the court or on the opinions. And I, so I, I thought some about that and I am pretty much convinced that whether you're a man or a woman, I don't think being a woman has an effect on the outcome of a case. I really believe that once, uh, when you reach a decision, that the decision is not made because of your experiences or your uh, gender. Now, getting to that decision, though, I think it is hugely important, and that's why I think diversity on appellate courts is so hugely important. The reason you have three judges on an appellate court is because you want the input of three different people we don't have one judge panels on appellate courts. Um, you want the input of three people, which theoretically would be different input, and therefore the difference in experiences, the different perspective that is brought to bear on a problem is very important. Uh, but in the end, w once those views have been expressed from wherever they come, uh, from each of the three members of the panel, I, I am not, I, I'm persuaded that it's a, the presentation is a matter of style. The ultimate decision making, I think, um, doesn't necessarily come from your, your gender uh, or, or, or your race. But there are concerns that are raised by women and by minorities that might never be seen by those who have never suffered those uh, or been in those situations, and that's what's important. And once you raise them, even to people who have not experienced them, they at least have the opportunity then to uh, be aware of them and reach a consensus on a, particular, on a particular problem. So I don't think it affects the judging. I do, affect, I do believe that it does affect your personal life in a way, in that I, I, my, my observation you know, you feel so stupid making these statements because you don't know how true they are or not, but my observation has been that women lawyers and women judges have a tendency to personalize the cases that they are working on a lot more than my male colleagues do, and therefore um, they live with the consequences or the results of a particular case uh, a lot more, I think. Um, these are tough times out there for law students. Uh, we're, you need to each hire a Pepperdine clerk. That's the first <laughs> point. Uh, <laughs> commercial message, I couldn't help myself. Um, uh, but but more, uh, more to the point of this, would you reflect with these students in particular about what, if anything, uh, a law student and a new lawyer might do, other than the obvious, get good grades and get on the law review, and what they might do for success in the profession in various ways. We all came in 
when we, no one ever said to me, apply for a clerkship. That was you just never, never on the table. And when I did go to interview with a Kansas City firm, and this is a quote, Danelle, don't you know you have to be better than the men? Well, those days were tough days for women trying to get jobs. These are tough days for men and women because the legal market is becoming so constricted. What advice, what should they do? Help these students out a little bit. I think you have to start early. Um, I think you need to make the summers work for you. Uh, and you need to be, uh, because very often the job that you get grows out of your experience in, in, in the summer working with a firm, for example. Um, but I agree with you. I had a son who graduated from law school in 2008 and uh, clerk for a federal district judge uh, for a year, and then was out, of, could not find a job for a year. Uh, but he, I might say he was pretty picky at the beginning of the year, and he got to be less picky <laughs> as the year went along, <laughs> and finally wound up taking a job that he had turned down at the beginning. But it was absolutely turned out to be an absolutely perfect job for him. But you need to start looking in different places too, for example, he is now an assistant district attorney in Midland, Texas, which is uh, you know far west Texas, flat as a pancake. It hasn't rained in Midland, I don't know, maybe six year. months, <laughs> a year. Uh, it hasn't rained in Houston in four months. But uh, you need to be thinking outside the box, and you need to be willing to go to places. For example, Houston has three law schools. Uh, and there's a huge influx of law school graduates in the Houston market. Midland doesn't have any law schools. So if you want to get a job, you're better off looking in Midland than you are in Houston. Um, and so you need to be thinking in those terms. Um, and you need to make the summers work for you uh, in terms of hopefully getting your foot in the door in a job that you would really like. Judge Nelson? Well, Maybe I should say what I look for in a law clerk because we get, you know, like 600 applicants for three spots. And of course, those 600 applicants have applied to maybe 25 judges. Yeah, so that's right. it's not necessarily you're the only one. I'm looking for clerks who want to make a difference in the world, to be quite honest about it. Uh, the applicants have wonderful grades. They have succeeded. Uh, they're from very good law schools like Pepperdine. But I always ask, what do you want to do with your life? And some very successful law students have gone lockstep through high school, college, law school, uh, boom, they're there. But I'm interested, have they written a book? What have they done in the community? Have they lived abroad? Were they in the Peace Corps? Uh, where have they worked? Uh, and a way to get a job, by the way, is to become active in your community through bar associations, through all sorts of organizations. Now, I have had many people who've been let go by major law firms in LA phone me up and say, I'll work for free if you'll just let me come and work. When I tell them I can't take them, go and volunteer someplace. And I just had a call from a clerk who volunteered with a public interest firm. He said, I'll come and work for nothing, and they needed him. After three works, they hired him. They found money for him. It could happen to her as well. So I think you're right. Make, make use of your summers, but also ask yourself, what do I want to do when I grow up? And it may seem like a silly question, but let me tell you, about 40% about of my ex-clerks are in academia. The next happiest group are working in government. They're US attorneys, they're public defenders, they're the, with the State Department and the Department of Justice. The next happiest um, are those with very small law firms, where they have a chance to go to court, they have a chance to be themselves. The wealthiest by far, but the least happy, to be quite honest, are with the big law firms. 
where their time is not their own. And, you know, 60, 65 hour weeks are expected. They're making lots of money. But I got a call from an ex law clerk working for a big New York firm who called me up and said, Judge, I have a problem. I'm making more money than my father made in his whole life. Uh, but I go home at night and ask myself, what have I done today that has any social redeeming value? I've gone through depositions, I've gone looking for a needle and saying, haystack. So I said, why don't you get out? Oh, <laughs> it's sort of like, I didn't think of that. I mean, it's not as if he was paying off law school debts. He, he paid them off, he's been out 10 years. And this happens to me all the time by former law clerks. So I say, you have to ask yourself, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and where do you want to be, you know, when you, I'll give you one example of a woman law clerk who went with a major law firm, president of the ABA was the chief of that firm. She got pregnant her first year and called me up and said, judge, I've got a problem. I said, what is it? Well, I'm pregnant. I said, well, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, but I don't want to lose my job. So I said, just go and tell your senior partner that you need a little time off. Oh, I'll come back to work the day after my baby is born. <laughs> ah. So she called me from the hospital. Judge, I've got a problem. I said, I know what it is. You don't want to come back to work. Ask for three months leave. What if he says no? I said, you have super credentials. You can go almost anywhere you want. Well, two and a half months later, the senior partner called me. He said, I want to speak to you, judge. <laughs> I said, well, isn't X working out? No, no, that's not the problem. But two young male associates came in and said, she's only going to work 40 hours a week. We're working 60 hours a week. We have small children. We don't care if we make senior partner as fast. We don't care if we're off the, the I said to the man, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> They, they understand that they have a purpose in life, and the LA County Bar spends $200,000 a year counseling young lawyers who have family problems, drug problems, alcohol problems, divorce problems, because they come home, stop by the bar on the way home and to relax, and then get up and are working 60, 70 hours a week. That's a long way of saying that I think you have to really decide what kind of life you have, what's most important to you, if it's being senior partner, uh, as fast as you can, then better stay there and work those 60 hour weeks. But if you have other goals in life, uh, think about those goals in life, and you can be a very happy lawyer, uh, doing things that maybe aren't exactly what the guy or girl sitting next to you in law school is doing. Judge Burkett. Sorry so long. No, 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 don't, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, I, I agree with both Judge King and Judge Nelson in terms of uh, you should make your summers work for you, you should be experienced. And secondly, uh, the, the, I too look for very diverse experiences rather than someone who has done really nothing uh, during their summers, just gone straight through school. And uh, there's no community service, there's no, uh, nothing of interest. And I think it's important because I think it is important, if they're gonna be giving me advice and talking back and forth about a particular case, I want someone that has had uh, as much experience as possible as they can have in their, in their young lives. From a practical point of view, if you want an appellate clerkship, you need to write. There, I, as Dorothy says, we, we get 600 applications. I weed them out by not even looking at any where there is absolutely no writing experience. Uh, just simply because they're with me for a year, I don't have time to engage and teach someone how to write or how to look at issues. So I, look, uh, I start by looking at those who have uh, writing experience of any kind, a law review, um, moot court, newspaper reporting, um, 
various journals, anything. I, I'm not picky about what it is, but I want to make sure that I don't, we don't need to start at teaching you how to write. And so I think that is hugely uh, important. And the, the, other, the one other thing I would say, you know, there's a lot of serendipity to whether or not you have the opportunity to clerk. But there's no serendipity involved in whether or not you make yourself totally uh, prepared if you get lucky enough to get a, a position. I mean, I, I've been listening to, to Judge King and, and Judge Nelson, and in both instances, everything they did, they did so well that whoever was involved in that endeavor recommended them or pushed them into another job. When, when you know, Judge King wasn't sitting in some uh, courtroom somewhere with her, you know, with her robe over her head when she became a, uh, the, the, um, the head of the judicial conference. That's an amazing thing for a woman. And she was admired for the job she did there. Why? Because she had done other things so well prior to that that people were ready to push her forward. And you heard Judge Nelson talk about being on these various committees, and each committee, she was being recommended for the next committee. Why? Because she did such a fabulous job. So the one thing I would leave with you is, no matter what you do, whatever job it is that you're doing, a particular class or a, uh, some job during the summer or your work on a note in the law review, you should do it as well as you can, because that is what leads to a recommendation to go to the next step or to do something else, should you have the opportunity to do that. We're almost to the end of our time, and I want to give a chance for some questions if people have them. But I suspect in your uh, array of experiences, you may have some either humorous or sort of uh, gut-wrenching stories about your uh, being a woman in the legal profession at the time we were. Do any of you want to share any of those? Well, <laughs> I think I already have. I mean, it's pretty gut-wrenching not to make partner in a firm where you poured your heart and soul for 10 years. But I'll tell you, it's a growth experience. The, the thing that you have to realize is that these bad things happen to good people even. And, and because something bad happens to you, it's simply one incident. And there is a, f a future and in which that, in retrospect, is not going to have been the coup de grace at all. So you can rely on your fellow citizens to help you, because in the end, they will, individually and collectively. One thing I would suggest, I have since I was 13 years old, worked for nonprofit organizations without ceasing all the way through since I was 13. And a lot of the experience that I've had, for instance, when I wound up as the chair of the executive committee of the Judicial Conference, which runs the whole federal court system, it's a seven billion dollar a year business. Not much, by the way, in the federal government, actually. A half of 1%, just hold that thought. You, you get us cheap. Um, but the experience that I had uh, as the chief financial officer of the United Way in Houston with 120 member agencies was what helped me know something about how to run a large organization. So all these experiences that I've had all along the way uh, working for nonprofit organizations, Baylor College of Medicine now, has really been an enormously important thing in terms of the various opportunities that come along to do other things that build on that experience. Whatever you do, every year of your life, you have to invest a certain percentage of it in your community. Everyone. That's absolutely required. So you just have to do it. It's a wonderful experience, but it also, as it happens with most things in life, pays dividends. Dorothy. Well, I agree absolutely with everything Judge King said. Well, I'll tell you one experience while I was dean. We had the Western Center in Law and Poverty, a joint project located at my school with UCLA and Loyola. We had an executive director, Derek Bell, who later went to Harvard decided to sue 
Police Chief Davis because of his discriminatory way of dealing with African Americans in the community. Quite frankly, my husband sat up with Derek and saying, you know, let's have him down. Let's, let's mediate. Let's medi um, he said, no, I have to get credibility in the community. So Western Center in Law and Poverty sued Police Chief Davis. Police Chief Davis went on channels 4, 7, and 11, calling me a communist woman, <laughs> underlined woman, that woman <laughs> law dean, using government funds to sue government officials. Well, two of my alumni, Arthur Alarcon, who later came on our court, Matt Byrne, who was then US attorney, said, Dean, you've got to meet with the police chief. So we set up a secret meeting at the Duck Press downtown, sort of a little out of the way restaurant. My husband circled round while I went in and we were to meet from seven till eight. As I drank my Shirley Temple and the police chief drank his martinis and the rest, I began to explain how important it was to bring lawsuits rather than going to the streets. And that there was great unrest. I had nothing to do with the decision to bring it, but once it was there, it was brought in good faith. Well, it got to be eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Finally at 10 o'clock, I said, Chief Davis, we, I shouldn't have mentioned his name, we have taken too much of time. Oh no, let's have another round. Well, <laughs> I get to law school and the student newspaper had a black headline, Dean Nelson caves in to Chief Davis. I don't know if I mentioned <laughs> Oh so God. the students, I was a fascist. Uh, to Chief Davis, I was a communist. <laughs> I was just trying to do my to job. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, it didn't help me with the Board of Trustees either at that time. But after a series of meetings, the police chief went back on television saying, I understand what the Western, I understand what Dean Nelson is doing, and that sort of mollified the trustees, because I've been told to stay out of the way of any trustee. And after we settle all that, after a few months, at big USC banquets, I went from the back of the bus up to the head table. Our lovely woman, Dean, um, is doing so well with the law school. But I don't think that Chief Davis would have attacked me had I not been a woman. He wouldn't have, have, have tried it. And the funny thing is, when he ran for the state legislature, he came and asked if I would endorse him <laughs> and have my picture taken with him. I, I declined. With that. <laughs> Rose, very quick, but, just a very quick story. And it's not so much about being a woman, but that you're talking about merit retention re reminded me of it. And it also maybe taught me to keep things uh, in, in perspective. Uh, merit, uh, my name was up on the ballot for merit retention in Florida during one of the times uh, that I was on the Florida Supreme Court. And I used to practice law and I was a trial judge in West Palm Beach, which is very close to Miami, which is where my parents lived. And my sisters and brothers, nieces and nephews and the whole clan lived. So I was able to get, and West Palm is about an hour and a half, an hour drive from Miami to West Palm, so I was able to get home fairly regularly, which was expected in my family. You attended everybody's birthday, everybody's holiday, everybody's everything. And then when I was appointed to the Florida Supreme Court, I had to move to Tallahassee, which is nine hours drive away from Miami. So uh, when, my, when it was time to vote for my merit, uh, on my merit retention campaign, my sister was taking my mother to vote because my mother uh, didn't read and write in English very well. So Chathi was taking her to, to vote. And as they were going into the voting booth, uh, my mother began to complain about the fact that she didn't see me very often anymore. I didn't get down to Miami, and I didn't come to this birthday party or that birthday party. And my sister says, well, but mom, you know, this is a bigger job, and she's very busy, and she doesn't have time, and it's so far away. And my mother said, well, why are we voting for her then? <laughs> I think I have to be the only candidate in the universe who didn't get their mother's vote. <laughs>
Okay, we have just a few minutes left, and I want to ask if anybody here wants to ask any questions. This is a very unusual chance. Uh, John Taha has a question. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. How often throughout the day accelerates by appearing on the ad? Does the next woman press, the first woman press, will be someone from the judiciary? Do you have I'm disqualified because I wasn't born in this country, so I can't <laughs> run. <laughs> Uh, he said he thinks maybe the first woman president will come from the judiciary. What do you think? Uh, it's very possible. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I think it would be wonderful, just wonderful. And that, in fact, I would. I'd love to do that. <laughs> oh, right oh. Right oh. Right <laughs> Carolyn King for president. <laughs> uh, then for sure, my mother wouldn't vote for me. Yeah, that, oh yeah. 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 I, I think my mother thinks I never figured out what I do when I grow up either. So. Shelly. 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 Yeah. Do you talk about maybe hear a story from you? Ah. Yes. Uh, but you guys get tired of hearing from me. Um, I'll tell one quickly, though, because, it, 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 and my husband and my mother know this very well, because for me it was so emblematic of the time. I uh, had been kind of a hot shot in Washington and was with a big law firm and was a White House fellow and done securities offerings, done all this stuff. But the love of my life, sitting here in the front row, um, uh, was in Concordia, Kansas. And so I left Washington and moved back to Concordia. Somehow forgetting that in middle America especially, there weren't women lawyers and there weren't women judges like there were in Washington and on some of the coasts. And I opened up the Wall Street Journal when I was thinking about coming home and saw, lo and behold, a little corporation in Kansas was going to go public and needed a lawyer with Wall Street experience. I had just come through a huge public offering at Hogan and Hartson. I thought, I think God's smiling. Who, this was in a little town that was about, oh, an hour and a half south of where we lived. And I was willing to drive an hour and a half both ways to be able to do this work. I apply, oh, and I should add that my dad and mom knew the president of the corporation. <laughs> uh, and my dad called this man, said my daughter is coming back to Kansas, and here's what she did. I applied, I went down, I w was interviewed twice, I never got a call mm -hmm. from that corporation, and they hired a brand newly minted Washburn Law graduate wow. instead of me, male. And I learned many years later that the reason was the chief counsel, who is now deceased, bless his soul, <laughs> uh, wife said, you will not travel to New York with a woman. And I didn't get the job. Hmm. Now, the good news was that a very benevolent lawyer in, in that little town let me off a share with him, and uh, I probably got better experience than I would have at this corporation, but it was not exactly a high-paying job. You talk about volunteering. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I've got tons of them, uh, but you know what? You're going to hear my stories over the years. I, uh, w I want to say a special thank you to those of you who've traveled here, especially my good friends. Uh, Carolyn and I could tell you some stories of judicial conference where the women literally had to take over, but we can't tell them because <laughs> we can't tell them because they're secret. But I, I can still see Carolyn King over one very large man, literally with his, <laughs> his neck. Uh, saying, you will do this. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And I had you right beside me. I had her back. I had her back. <laughs> so we, we had a time, and still in the conference, there are many women uh, in very responsible uh, committee positions. So I thank you all for coming. My husband, my daughter, Megan, Karen was my roommate in law school. And thank heavens, she and Paul live in in LA, so I get to see him more now. And my mother, who I'll just say is on the other side of 90, and she's doing pretty darn good. I'm safe. So, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and
And finally, I want to say a word to the faculty and to Provost uh, Tippins and President Benton for the search committee. I see Professor Ogden out here and I have probably other members of the search committee uh, for reposing this trust in me. As I have said many times, I have returned to legal education for the reasons that all these judges have referred to. When you get at this stage of your career, you say, where could I marginally maybe make a difference for the future? And for me, the answer was back in legal education, though I loved being a judge and I miss these colleagues greatly, but I just get them to Pepperdine, so it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, okay, I think, Mr. President, you're on. <laughs> Well, I want to join the uh, provost in uh, welcoming you here today. I want to thank Judges King and, and Nelson and uh, Barquette for coming and presenting and sharing their story. Right now, uh, Dean Taha, those of us who had a hand in your hiring and bringing you here are feeling pretty smart and smug. And uh, <laughs> you're going to be a great dean. And uh, gatherings like this, uh, unfolding the law and the legal career uh, for our students and for those of us who love the law alongside them, uh, this is going to be a great run, and we're really glad that you're dean of our law school at this particular time in our, in our history. I teach, um, in addition to my day job as president, I, I teach uh, undergrad students constitutional law. And I do love the power of story. And so I, I try to let them know about little Linda Brown from Topeka, Kansas, and Danny Escobedo, and Ernesto Miranda, and some of the great cases that um, enlighten and enliven our law school and classrooms. <clears throat> It occurs to me that uh, federal judges have pretty interesting stories, too. And uh, thank you so much for unfolding them and, and sharing them. It inspires our students, and frankly, it inspires um, all of us who are here today to lives uh, in the law. My daughter is a recent graduate of our, of our law school, and uh, she fortunately has moved into the legal profession into basically open arms. And I, I feel that, that it is people like you, lawyers like you, who preceded her who made that possible. And I'm so grateful to you for that aspect at a personal level as a father, for the groundbreaking, ice-breaking, uh, glass ceiling-breaking uh, work that you've done in your career. So thank you very much for sharing your stories and adding your stories to uh, the story of our law school and uh, what we believe is a very, very bright future indeed. Let's uh, give our panelists another round of applause. We're going to give um, uh, the dean and our panelists a chance to leave for some photos. I'd like for you to remain seated for just a moment, and then we'll go outside together and enjoy a reception together with the judges and, and Dean Taha. Thank you so much. And with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>